Hey, how's it going, everybody? We'd like to uh, welcome everybody to come out for coming out to the you know tonight's hangout. This is the uh, Digital Currency Association for Minorities session that we're having tonight. So you know we have some great topics we're gonna discuss around the the recent fork with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. So we're gonna have some great discussions. We're taking all your questions that you may have as we go through uh, tonight's discussion here. We also want to talk about just some of the crazy profits and gains that people are starting to get here. But we understand that there are a lot of questions that you all may have for us. So we're here to actually take those questions. I'm one of your hosts, I'm, uh, Anthony. And then our other host we have is, is Tony on the line. Tony, you there? Tony, can you hear us? So hopefully we didn't lose Tony here. We've been having a few technical difficulties. So hopefully you know he'll come on in just a second. But hey, let's just go ahead and start with the uh, with the question and answer session, and then we'll jump right into everything around the fort. So hey, uh, Eric, I know you had some questions for us here in the hangout. What what you got for us, brother? Well, the uh, just in general, I was uh, I guess pretty excited about all the information, especially from last Tuesday with the the fork and the split and i think i threw it out to there to the group uh but in general i was just trying to get you know feedback and thoughts on you know how people felt about the whole fork and you know where people were deciding to maybe to invest that and everything like that so maybe just as we wait for uh, tony to get on maybe just people's thoughts as things kind of transpired how things happen yeah i mean that's that's a great point here you know, for for my uh, for myself here. Hi, who just joined? It was me. Drop me again. I don't okay. know what's going on. That, that, there you go, Tony. You, you're in nice and clear now, man. So so we got you. So Tony, let's just do a, a quick recap of what's happened since our last session two weeks ago. We talked about the upcoming fork. Can you kind of break down this fork in, in layman's term and very basic, you know, ways that you know all of our viewers and listeners can can understand that as we get into this discussion tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when people think about fork, they tend to think about um, in relation to the stock market, where if a stock splits and let's say your stock is $50 and you have one share of the stock, that it would create two shares of the stock at $25 a piece. So with the fork, it's a little bit different. With the fork, what it does is it creates an exact duplicate copy, duplicate amount of shares and or coins and the value of it is the difference between the two sets of values so when bitcoin forked what happened is however many bitcoin you had you ended up with an equivalent amount of bitcoin cash so if you have one bitcoin which was roughly around twenty eight hundred dollars at that time um eight hundred dollars plus you had one Bitcoin Cash that had whatever the value of Bitcoin Cash was at that time, so three hundred or thirty one hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean that that was so cool because you know thank you for for explaining that because I was one of those people, you know, as I'm still learning here about you know digital currency. Um, that's really one thing that I was looking at, right? Trying to uh, trying to estimate how much is my portfolio grown, and, and at first I did exactly like you said. I was thinking in terms of of cash when it's really in terms of, as you said, the unit of a Bitcoin that you own. So yes, I am a, a proud owner of both, you know, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. But I think some of the other questions that come out is how do you access, you know, the Bitcoin Cash? Or what would you recommend? I mean, we saw a lot of different things um, on, you know, discussion boards and on posts and in articles that said, you know, in order to get it, you have to give up your private key. But we know you don't want to let your private key out to to just anyone. So what are some of your thoughts, you know, around that um, as to how you start to access that Bitcoin cash and actually starting to use it? So since we started uh, last week's uh, Wallet 101 with talking about Jack's wallet, I'm going to use Jack's as the primary example. So uh, Jack's right now is developing the APIs that allow them to be able to access your equivalent Bitcoin cash amount. That hasn't been uh, completed yet. And since it's an iOS 
and Android app. It needs to get approved uh, definitely in the, in the um, iOS app store. So your money is there. You're just not going to be able to see it until you go into Jax in the section that says wallets and Bitcoin Cash shows up as one of your wallet selections. For some of the other um, exchanges that are out there like Coinbase or Poloniex or some of the other ones, uh, I know Coinbase originally said that they were not going to uh, support Bitcoin Cash, but then they did an about face on that and ended up giving people access to their Bitcoin Cash. So it really depends on where your money is. The, the way that you access it is different depending on where you're storing all your Bitcoins. But even if you don't have access to it, whenever whatever it is that you're storing your Bitcoins on support it, it'll be there. And it'll be the equivalent amount of Bitcoin that you had the moment that the fork happened. And it will be whatever value it is on that particular day. So, for example, when the fork happened, if it was $100, but when you get access to it, it's $200, you'll have $200 worth, not $100. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's good because, as you said, I, I haven't accessed it, so I really haven't had a chance to to go and exchange it or, you know, do some type of trading with it. But hopefully, you know, I'll wait for, for that currency to grow. As I was out looking at, uh, you know, where it is in the market today, you know, I bought it when, uh, or when it, you know, when it split, you know, we, we got, we had it for about $200 worth of value. I think today um, it's up in the, in the 300s, right? Yeah, I think so it's I mean, around 330 or something. Yeah, yep. uh, three, 337. You know, but the but the big story here too is man, Bitcoin has been off the chain, having some some great growth here um, since since the split, right? I mean, I'm kind of surprised that happened. Was it a surprise to you? Because I mean, it's grown from about twenty eight hundred dollars to about thirty four hundred dollars in just a matter of days. Um, so so how does how do you feel about that, Tony? Yeah, and if you remember um, about a week before the actual split occurred, when it wasn't quite sure whether they were going to split or not, it actually went down to around 1700 1780 or something like that at the lowest amount. So I think that what's happening is that because of the, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for, the confusion about what's going to happen. And, and the main thing is, people don't really understand the space. So when someone says a fork, what does that mean? And what does it mean when you're not gonna have access to your money? What does it mean when all of these coins come about and you've got different values for different things? All of that confusion served to drive the price down to a certain degree. Now that all of that is starting to sort itself out, uh, the price on all the coins are going back up a little bit. In addition to that, one of the things that was a part of the Bitcoin fork and the primary driver for the Bitcoin fork was actually was um, Bitcoin had one vision of how they wanted to manage everything going forward. And the people who do Bitcoin cash had another vision of how they wanted to do things going forward. Before the fork, they were all a part of the collective pool of miners. And miners are the people who are actually running the technology that secures the system and they get rewarded for being a participant in the system uh, every two minutes. Like uh, every two minutes, some mi 10 minutes, some miner gets a reward of 25 Bitcoins. So being a part of that. And there's a lot of technical details that kind of go into that that are a little bit too low level to go into. But for the most part, Bitcoin Cash wanted to be able to have what's called bigger blocks, meaning they wanted to be able to store more transactions before they pass the information over. And Bitcoin did not want to have bigger blocks because they feel like the concept of bigger blocks is going to somehow violate the, the, the integrity of the vision that Satoshi had whenever he built Bitcoin in the first place. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, I'm agreeing with you, yep. Yeah. So the Bitcoin Cash people said, we're just going to split everything off and we'll go over here with our vision. The Bitcoin people said, we're going to split everything off and go over here with our vision, or stay on the main chain. Um, today, I, there's something called uh, SegWit. And SegWit is another way to be able to kind of group these transactions, just talking about it at a higher level. And that got locked in. So the way things get locked in in a blockchain is a little bit different than the way 
gets upgraded. So with a software upgrade like Microsoft or something, they'll send a patch out, and that patch will go out to every computer that has a valid copy of uh, Microsoft software on it. But with the blockchain, what has to happen is you set the parameters for when it becomes a rule, and after a certain amount of blocks go through, then it becomes a rule. So SegWit was locked in today as a a, a, a uh, an actual valid part of how they're going to manage their transactions. So that's another thing. So the prices go up as it approaches some of these uh, technical implementations, because if it looks like it's going to work, then the price is going to go up. And once it's done, the price will probably drop just a little bit. Nice, nice. And so that applies to all of the coins, actually. Right now, oh, let me make sure I, I say this here. I mean, we, we joined, we said little technical difficulties. Let's just talk one quick thing about, you know, the Digital Currency Association. One thing is we're not investors, okay, everybody. We're not here to sell you anything. We're not here for some type of multi-level marketing uh, scheme or, or anything like that. Really, this is all about education. These are some of the personal things that we're sharing with you that we're doing or that Tony's doing and how we analyze the, the, the market and how we analyze the technology and things that's taking place. So as, as with anything, you know, consult your accountant or your tax professional as you go out and you do some of these things here, right? But, but for us, you know, we're just sharing with you and being very open and honest. And one of our main missions is to make sure that, you know, minorities have a chance to learn about this technology, learn how they can apply this technology, and learn about how this technology is starting to become this new, I would say, um, base layer or, or how most of the internet is going to operate in the future. So some of the future things we'll talk about, which is a little bit more technical, is, is more than just the currency here. We actually want to talk about the underlying technology, as Tony was just mentioning, and that really deals about you know the blockchain. And that's really where this value is starting to come in and what gives the currency its value. I know we've had a lot of people say, well, what makes Bitcoin valuable? What makes Ether valuable? What makes IOTA valuable? What makes Litecoin valuable? It's so many different coins out there, right? But you still have to kind of do your due diligence to understand what the value is in each one of those coins. And really the values in that underlying technology and how it's applied, I would say, across, you know, the Internet in a digital standpoint or even offline um, in, in different corporations, businesses. So it's more than just trading and buying stuff when you think about, you know, digital currencies or or the blockchain. And Tony, if I misstated something, please, please correct me there. No, no. I mean, that's absolutely perfect. Like one of the most basic things that um, you should be uh, considering is what's called the incentive algorithm. And um, now I'm gonna just turn it over and ask some questions to the, the people. Yeah, let's the call. some questions. I know some may have to drop here. Eric, I know you, you may have to drop soon, brother. I wanna make sure we, we get your questions here answered, man. So, you know, it's an open session, you know, in, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about, you know, your question or, or about yourself and then your question. Okay. Um, yeah, Eric uh, went to A and T, the best school of all time. So <laughs> we'll put that out there. That's uh, right. Happy Pride, baby. Um, no, I guess um, one additional question is: as the split is happening, um, how do you foresee? I guess just um, and Anthony, maybe you could put a point like where to go. Um, I guess my question is like, when more and more of these new currencies are coming out, um, how are you doing, how are you going about doing your research, you know, on the front end mm -hmm. that, uh, make it as vital as possible so you can get more educated. And I think that can help out with everybody as we start to do our research. Should we invest in this one or should we invest in the other one? What are, what type of research or I guess resources you're using to uh, kind of do it on the front end? So one of the questions that somebody asked in the, um, the, the group, Facebook group a little while back, there was a, 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 a coin that raised around $7 million that a, a sister um, created. And they were asking um, whether or not I thought that coin was a you know, particular value or not. And I didn't necessarily respond to it because a part of it is there, there's always some psychological component to these coins as well. Right. So if, 
people believe that this person is creating something of value and want to support this person, then the price of the coin is going to be supported by that. So that's always something to take into account. And you can uh, read about just by you know googling news about that particular coin or um you know checking out press releases and those types of things so i, I definitely don't want to discount that part uh, and it's something that you should always be aware of because the, the the sentiment of everything is going to be very important there's a psych a lot psychology and masses and you know the same thing applies to the stock market as well just looking at the technical uh details because that's pretty much where I, I spend a lot of my time looking into uh, the value of coins. One of the first things that I look at is the incentive. And the incentive is how do the miners get paid by, for participating in the network? So in order to have a coin that is not able to be, let me think of how to phrase this. There's a type of attack that exists for all blockchains, where if someone has 51% of the power of the miners, then that person can effectively rewrite the blockchain. So the way that you distribute that power is by incentivizing people to participate in the network such that you don't have just one person that has all the power. That's the decentralization part of it that's very key to how blockchains work in, in general. And I look at the incentive as one of the first things I look at for a coin, is there's two types of incentives that are primary, and, and, and uh, IOTA is a little bit different. There's one called Tangle for that. Mm -hmm. But the first one is proof of work, and the second one is proof of stake. And with proof of work, what's happening is, um, think it back to Napster. Anybody who joins the network is, is a part of the network. They have a node. You're able to see each other's information. You're able to share. You don't necessarily have to know exactly where something is coming from, but you're able to connect to it. And it, it's this distributed network everybody has a part, is a part of. So for proof of work, all of those computers that are connected in the network and designated as nodes, which are the, the primary miners, they're competing to solve a math problem. And I'm being very high level with this. And whenever someone solves the math problem, then that computer is the one that gets the 25 uh, Bitcoin reward. So back in the days when uh, Bitcoin first came out, like 2008 or so, you could, you could do that using just your personal computer. Um, but they have a concept in this proof of work that underlies Bitcoin called uh, difficulty, where the difficulty level goes up ever so often so that people who are operating those computers have to use more and more power to be able to solve that problem. At this point, it's kind of cost prohibitive to be able to maintain a node on that network. But the, the point that I'm trying to make here is when you look at the incentive that your coin is under, these are the types of things you have to take into account to be able to determine whether it's valuable or not. Another type of incentive is called proof of stake. And proof of stake is however many percent of a coin that you have, when your computer is a part of the network, you have the random uh, probability of being able to create that percent of coins and then you own them on your own. So it's, and it's, uh, with proof of work, it's called mining and proof of stake is called minting because you're like printing that amount of coins. So um, when I look at a coin, I'm looking at is it proof of stake or is it proof of proof of um, proof of work? Proof of work is actually very, very expensive in the sense that they actually sell little heaters, those little uh, heaters that you can generate because your computer's going so fast, it generates heat and you can buy the heater and the heater is a part of the network and the heater solving the problem and it's giving off heat. And if you happen to make a block, you can make 25 <laughs> Bitcoin or whatever. But um, proof of stake is much less, it's much more energy efficient. 
So they want people to move to proof of stake, but there's a lot more proof of work um, coins out there. So that that's one thing. Tony, you're getting, getting, you're getting real, real deep again, real deep, real deep here, you know. <laughs> but but that, that but but that's the whole thing, everybody. This is like we said, more than currency. It's a lot dealing with, you know, the the technology, the underlying technology. Um, here. So, so one other thing, Eric, to kind of answer your question, what I've done is there is a, a coin that I'm kind of researching called IOTA. And uh, it's, it's a coin that's based around the Internet of Things. Tony talked about it. It actually uses a different type of network than, than the blockchain, but it, it, still, it still is a digital currency. So some currencies don't even use the blockchain. They use something called Tangled, as, as he just mentioned. So I'm trying to learn about that technology. Um, and I've heard a lot about this coin. So some of the some of the good coins are, are like cream that kind of rises to the top, and you kind of can play there. But just like the market, there's some other coins that that are a lot more riskier. That's that's out there that you could that you could invest in, and we could call them penny shares, right? I mean, some of them are, you know, sixteen cents, you know, fifteen cents, and I mean, you know, you could you could try a long shot. You, you might get that if you're looking at it from trading. So. As Tony talked about with the wallet before, if you're just looking at it from a trading standpoint, then you may want to keep your things in in tight in a um, in an exchange so you can easily buy, sell, and trade. Then there's other things that you may want to to buy and hold, right? Which you'll move that to to your wallet or or to kind of like a cold storage, as we talked about uh, two weeks ago. So hopefully that that kind of helps helps answer your question. Hey Charlton, I don't know if you if you're in a good place to talk yet. I know you might have had some questions for for the group here. Um, so if you are available to talk, you know, go, go ahead and let us uh, hear your questions. Yeah, hey everybody, uh, just had a couple of questions. Uh, spoke with Anthony a while back about it, and I'm you know very interested and whatnot. So I may have some critical questions and some that are you know. But my first question uh, goes to Anthony's point about you know it being like you know decentralized and not really regulated like that. So, <clears throat> some of so what's a measure that could happen? Or who's to say that the the, uh, the creator comes back in and wants to do another fork or decides that he wants to, you know, print up more Bitcoin? Is there like a cap, you know, that kind of caps all you know uh, the Bitcoin so that it won't so that the value will stay where it's at or it won't fluctuate as much? I'm just I just think about um, you know since this is such a new area, you know, what, what, where are any kind of stop gaps for that type of um, fluctuation happen or with this uh, type of technology. So that's another thing that you have to um, pay attention to whenever you're trying to determine whether or not you want a coin. So with Bitcoin, Bitcoin has what's called, it, it's a deflationary coin. There is a cap on the number of Bitcoins that will be made at any point in time. And Bitcoin will reach that cap in the year 2140. So after 2140, there will never be any more Bitcoin that are ever created unless somebody, uh, you know, does a fork or something like that and changes that rule. But more than likely, they're not going to change that rule. That rule is super um, to what Bitcoin's purpose is. For coins that have a cap, the likelihood that the price is going to go up over time is high because it's a, it's a supply and demand thing for coins that don't have a cap you know that price may go up or down but um to answer your question is something that's chosen at the time when the coin is made exactly what rules you want to apply to the coin i think bitcoin cash also has a cap on it litecoin being a fork of bitcoin also has a cap on it so so with all the different types of coins coming out i mean I guess you really, again, like investing in the stock market, you really have to be abreast of like what the technology, what the company's doing to kind of see what the vision and future is uh, for these different companies. I mean, how do you kind of pick one out of the litter right now? I mean, we know Bit Bitcoin is uh, the top right now. Ethereum is doing, is doing uh, it seems like it's kind of following uh, those footsteps. I mean, how do you kind of decide, how do you stay abreast to kind of decide which one uh, to fully invest in or should you, you know, spread it around, spread the wealth nope. across them all? You know, Charlton, from a, I'm giving my oversimplified answer to that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, my, my simplified answer. One is, 
you know, we post a lot of articles on on our Facebook group page. Inside those articles, it, it talks about a lot. Um, I know Tony really does research, so those are from some very good accredited uh, places where the articles come from. And one article talked about some of the top coins and had like the top 13 coins, right, that, that are out today. And they give you links. You can go to their website. You can read about it. Um, they probably have a, a Facebook page, maybe even YouTube page, you know, all those types of things. Um, what we talked about before, just some of the top four that, that you always hear about, you know, which are some of the oldest, you know, from, from Bitcoin to Litecoin, the Ether, you know, um, those, those are just, um, and then you have, um, uh, the one that the banks are using, my mind's going blank right now. Ripple, right? So I haven't bought Ripple because you almost have to use a different exchange to get the Ripple, but um, th that's another one. So when you think about, as he said, technology, the, a lot of banks use Ripple, right? Which has a certain technology to uh, allow banks to transfer, you know, inter international funds a lot quicker and faster. Um, so this is actually being used by corporate America. Then you take one, as I mentioned earlier, name uh, IOTA, right? Um, I'm looking to to buy a habit. That's really about, you know, machine to machine, the Internet of Things, and having machines actually do uh, work and actually get micro payments. And when you think about what a micro payment is in the Bitcoin or in the digital currency space, the average payment can only you know, in, in U.S. dollar goes to one penny, right, which is two digits behind the decimal place. But if you think about it from a digital currency, you can go all the way to eight digits behind that decimal place. So as you can do what's called micropayments. So um, that allows machine to machine, right, without even humans, machines to machines to start to interact, right, and send payments for doing certain type of work. So you, you can find one about things that you're interested in. So it's a hangout in New York tonight around art and how they will apply the blockchain technology to art. Uh, the one Tony mentioned earlier was about how she applied it to medical records. So when you think about it, especially from your position, think about a software that you're developing and you're tying a digital currency. And because you're using a distributed um, ledger or, or distributed uh, servers around, you have to pay those people for using it and you utilize that by creating a coin, right? So that's the oversimplified verse, Anthony's version, you know, not Tony's, Anthony. Uh, <laughs> you know, because we both named Anthony, right? But, right, right, right. but at the end of the day, I think if you think about it from how do you have a software and how can you apply that software across different use cases um, throughout the industry, it might be a coin for that, right? So that's probably gonna be how they say it's an app for that. In the future, they're gonna say it's a coin for that, right? Because it's just about a new way of, of creating software and distributing that on or a new software platform that people will utilize for certain applications. Yep. And to, to add on to Anthony's point, there's really two ways of looking at it whenever you um, kind of start your research and decide what you wanna pay for. There's the investor view and there's the, uh, tech, the, the, the use case view. So with the investor view, let's say you have enough money to put a large chunk of change into something like an ICO where they're selling the first offering of a coin and they're selling that coin for $25 and you've got $1,000. So you're going to buy um, some number of shares and you're hoping that it is a big bounce and it, and, you know, it goes up and you sell it and you've made a ton of money and you're good. If it comes to market, then you're looking at your criteria a little bit differently. Because I like the technical part, because I work in technology and have been in the business for 20 years, I take more of a long approach to it. And I'm looking at it, what is the use case that you're trying to solve? And why would somebody use your coin to solve this problem as opposed to use some regular client server technology? Like we talked a lot in, in this class that I, I took Cryptocurrencies a, a couple months back. Uh, this is super far out use case, but it's it's possible. So you have a self driving car, and your car takes you to work, and you go up and you work in your cubicle. And rather than having your car just sit in the parking lot and wait for you to come back down, you let your car use some Uber type technology to pick people up. Now people can't give your car cash, 
people would pay your car in digital currency. So your car is making money while you're working as well. So those are the types of use cases and things that are out there long term. We just haven't gotten to the point yet where people are ready to adopt it like that. So when I'm thinking about a coin, I'm thinking about the longer term, what's going to happen with this coin if the use case for this coin is realized. Right. That's a, that's a good, that's a good, real good uh, way to look at it there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the applications are, are, are crazy. Um, I've been meaning to, to post this and I'll say it here, if you want to know about the application use case, but not too techy, there is a, a book that's out called the Bitcoin revolution. Right. And that's one that, that I'm actually listening to from a, from an audio book standpoint. And I'll give you another one, as, as Tony said, right, they go so deep and this one kind of got me because it kind of gets close to my everyday nine to five job. But they actually said, imagine um, like weather nodes. Right. There's all these different weather stations or, or weather posts. And you know how they say, oh, the weather's here on top of this building or the weather's here in all these different locations. We're talking about from a technology standpoint, taking all these different weather nodes around the world and creating a mesh network. And each one of these weather nodes actually every minute or so gives out, you know, what the weather is, what the temperature is, what the wind is, et cetera. They all are using, let's just say solar, right? They're on top of buildings, they're on top of poles. Well, each time that one weather node sends data to the overall network or the blockchain, that one node gets paid. So think about it like Tony just said, now you have some technology out there that's doing nothing but taking weather, but it's making or making or receiving um, what we would like to say as uh, those micro payments, right? And they work 24 seven, you don't have to do anything. You just set it up and every time it happens now, it uses kind of like this trust and says, okay, if Anthony's node is here and it's saying this and a node you know, a mile away is completely different. You know, they try to do algorithms to see which note is correct. If yours isn't correct, then that note doesn't get paid, right? So it makes sure that the accuracy of the temperature and all that is, is pretty correct. So, I mean, it's, it's really cool when you start to uh, apply this technology into, into all these different spaces, right? And it took me a while to really open up my mind to understand, man, this is like new software. I mean, Tony and I, was vibing on on a new uh, use case just a few days ago, right? I'm um, saying, man, this would this would be cool. But then you got to get into the whole software piece and find miners, and that's the and that's the part that's intriguing to to me more than just the currency. But it, it takes education, right? And as Tony, he's gone to classes. I've done one online, just trying to make sure you understand that. And and I know you as a technologist too. There, Charlton is something that you may be able to apply you know, at, either at your everyday, at your company, or as we said, even your own personal business, especially with, with taking payments or, or doing development type of work. So there's a guy, his name is um, Anton, Anton Antonopoulos. So I'll put him in the uh, Facebook group later on. And Anton Antonopoulos wrote a book recently called The Internet of Money. And he's the person who truly believes that eventually everything that we do on the internet, because what blockchain enables you to do is the exact same things that you're doing right now, but add a money layer to it and an identity layer to it. Why would you not change everything that we're doing right now over into some money version of itself? So example of that would be like, you go in and you like somebody's post. Well, if you can like their post and that post gives them money, then why would they choose to do it for free? So, you know, the, expanding your mind it's almost like um anthony said like you, the way that you have to think about the world and what is possible now has to really expand to 10 years from now what can this particular technology do and would it still be around and if it's possible you know there's no problem in putting money into it if it's uh, um, you know the first uh, i think the first value for bitcoin was something like 10 cents so if you created a whole bunch of Bitcoin at that time and just held on to that Bitcoin, your 10 cent is now worth $3,000 each. So there's no rush. And it's only been nine years. You can't get those types of returns from a stock market.
All right, we looks like we. Oh, I missed the question here. Um, man, a question just popped up in a way. My screen's working. I can't see it. Hold on. Let me see what question we got from from my chat room. What does blockchain technology smart contracts mean for you know um, security companies? When you define security companies, are you do you mean like cyber security companies, um, technology security companies? Um, security companies at home, so please, please define which which kind. Oh, so, like cybersecurity uh, companies here, Tony. This is really this is really in your space, right? <laughs> For real. <laughs> this is all of your. Space. What does blockchain technology, smart contracts mean for you know cybersecurity, technical security type of company? So I'm gonna I'm gonna say this about smart contracts. Like I might not be, I might not be as uh, bullish on smart contracts right now in the in the way that they are. I mean, because they're 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 not as smart as they need to be to be able to keep up with the type of innovation that you have in cybersecurity. I, I think um, AI is probably more um, is more where things are going to go in cyber security because you can create they actually i think it was around a year or so ago they, someone created two ai bots one of them was designed to hack the computer of the other one and the other one was constantly evolving to try to prevent the hacks so um as far as smart contracts goes there's people out there who are trying to build things related to cyber security but i'm just not really bullish on that sweet sweet any any other questions coming out? Um, you know, I know we have we have a new person to join, uh, Clarence here. So, uh, Clarence, you got any questions for us? I know you've been doing a ton of research. You can just take yourself off mute if if you have any questions for for the group here. So, uh, so Terrence out out in Kansas City, man. You know, I mean, this is good. We got people from all over here, from New York, Kansas City, here here in Atlanta. You know, uh, Terrence, anything for the la for us over the last two weeks? I know it was your first time learning about you know Bitcoin and technology. Saw some of your your posts and um, on the page. You you have any questions for us? Yeah, I had to get off of mute. Um, no real questions. Just after the last call, went ahead, um, bought some Bitcoin. I think um, we had referenced um, y'all referenced Coinbase. So I used that, and then after that, um, you know, per Tony's suggestion, got it out of the exchange and into Jax. It's just been there sitting, so just, you know, pretty cool seeing it grow and just, you know, learning more about the technology. Well, well actually, yeah, both you and Eric did receive all the winners, you know, two weeks ago of, of some Bitcoins, right? So, so yeah, that's the way to take out. That. That's yeah, the way to take out. I got the, I got the whole 3,000. I appreciate that. Hey, <laughs> I, I wish I could give out that kind. You know, hey. I'm just joking, guys. I'm just we, get, we get enough viewers and stuff, you never know. YouTube may, may break us off a little something, right? But that's a good example. So so let's talk about this use case, right? You, you just made me think about it. Take, take YouTube, for instance. If you get enough viewers on your page, YouTube starts to do what? They put advertisements on your page. YouTube makes money, and in turn, they actually, you know, share that money with you. So, and that's what Tony is trying to say when you say content and this type of content that we're developing has a price. It's a value there. And in all the different clicks that happen on the internet has a value associated with it. So if you imagine taking the same technology kind of like YouTube and you apply it to Facebook, and as Tony said, like likes, right? People might stop giving out likes, or people might like content they really like, which means it has a value. And because a lot of people go in there, guess what? You can get paid. So, I mean, now, those are the types of things that starts to happen um, with, with just the technology here um, and how this is going to be applied across the net. And then Tony actually uh, put out a good article today, overstock.com. You know, said that they will take over forty different type of coins. Th that's huge. I mean, Amazon doesn't take coins directly, right? Um, so for Overstock to really start taking those coins now, th th that's huge. You know, they're they're one of the first ones. It's a really really big company jumping in. And trust me, you can see that banks are starting to jump into the currency. Um, 
currency market here. I mean, there's there, there's a lot that's starting to take place. And like we said, that's why we wanted this association so we can talk and we can all just bring, you know, new things that we found out and new ideas that we have, right, um, up to light. Hey, Ann, hey, yeah. real quickly, um, and something I know um, uh, Anthony shared as well, and I shared it to you, but um, you guys, and especially in the markets, I mean, all over, what you're going to realize, you're going to see in uh, gas stations, you're going to have a regular ATM and you're going to have a <laughs> nice, shiny, white, bright, nice Bitcoin ATM right beside it, giving you an opportunity. So I was just randomly here going to a Shell gas station and, you know, just in a random area in Atlanta. Went over there, I saw the ATM, I was like, what is the other? And it was the Bitcoin one yes. right here. So that's yeah. just going to let you know how this movement is going to take a, you know, take a... Take so let, a let's, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, right? That That's a good one. Um, when I first started, that was what I was trying to do. I was trying to get, uh, you know, Bitcoin ATMs, figure out what places I could strategically place them around, you know, um, around Atlanta and different cities and... And that's what I started talking to Tony with um, about at first. You know, the key is the, the ATMs is a, is a little tricky, a little tricky. Number one, their their uh, rate is very, very high. I mean, right. they may have like 17 percent. Um, but actually, that's the way I bought my very first Bitcoin was with a Bitcoin ATM because I was interested in, in that space. Um, other things there, there is uh, regulation, um, state level regulation for these ATMs. And one of those biggest, one of the big ones is making sure like anti um, um, money laundering type of stuff. But there are some advantages, you know, to that if, if you want to, and I'm putting up air quotes here, keep your identity hidden, right? Because in Coinbase, you have to give up identity. You can utilize, you know, the, the ATMs, but there's only a certain amount of money that they're going to allow for you to, to deposit into the machine. You know, when, when you go with that, uh, what is it, anonymity, right? You want your um, triple play? Or so, I, I was interested in the triple play. However, I said that I would call, contact me back once I got, um, once I spoke to everyone in my household. All right. Maybe maybe she, she she's on another call here. But um, <laughs> but that's okay. That's This is live, baby. This is how we do. We have fun. People ask questions. This is what it's all about. She so, wanted that triple play combo. So just just to let you know, she wanted that triple play. There you go. There you go. <laughs> the triple play. <laughs> but yes. I was actually about to ask Tanny if she had a question because Tanny and I have been going back and forth with each other. And if I'm saying the name wrong, I apologize. Um, so I know that she's definitely very interested in like uh, bringing people into this space too. So I, I'm not, I don't know if she can hear us, but yes, I, I'd love to hear if she had any questions before we yeah, hopefully that, that was a question with the with the cyberspace, but hopefully it um, sound like she's on another call. If not, we, we can be able to to hear her in just a moment. But uh but yeah, Eric, so you're right. The the market's changing. Um we, we see that happening with, with the ATMs that, that are popping up and, and the revolution is real. I mean, we we have to get on board as as a group of people and figure out what can we do to to be in that new cutting edge because we have very um lack of representation you know especially in the technology field and you don't have to be the smartest person and what else we're trying to do in this network is to link you know technologists with you know project managers with product managers so when you have an idea feel free to share it right you know do a non-disclosure agreement you know but we want to make sure if you're looking for somebody that needs this type of um, you have an idea and you're looking for somebody to help develop it. We want to put those people together. If you want to talk about investing, um, you know, um, uh oh, she, she's asking a question here. Hey, I'm going to take you off mute this time so you can ask your question. Everybody can hear your lovely voice. So so uh, is, it, is it Tanya? Um, let me take you off mute. It's Tanya. Go ahead. Go ahead. Introduce yourself. Oh, I. There you go. Hold on. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I accidentally put you back on mute. It's all on you. Go ahead. You have the floor. Let me stop chewing my chips now because. <laughs> <laughs> you might get us all hungry. <laughs> so my question is, oh, well, my name is Tony Chambers. I'm out of uh, Brooklyn, New York. And um, 
I discovered um, a DCAM through the Tech Fam group. So, um, so thank you guys, Tony and Anthony, right? Um, for the group and what you guys are doing. It's definitely been beneficial to me, so, and I'm sure it is to others. So thank you, first of all. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool, thank you. Thank um, you for joining, you know, you, you don't have to, right? You don't have to spend this time with us, but, but you have, <laughs> we've been seeing you, right? And you had, to, you came out with a real compelling post. You was the yeah. first one to post about the, the young lady uh, that, mm -hmm. that did the initial coin offering, right? So that was awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what I really, I, I found out about her, I'm just trying to kind of plays into the question I have because I found out about her because um, I'm I'm actually producing a film, long story about women of color entrepreneurs and um, the intersectional. When we look at it from an intersectional perspective of how women are the fastest growing group in in entrepreneurship and all the great sound bites that the media has given us, when we look deep into it there are some real issues, not only in the tech industry, which we you probably hear about a lot if you're in tech, not only in diversity and corporate, but there's just a lot of issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most definitely. Right, so one of them is that, you know, we are the lowest on the totem pole for raising money. And so I see, I see pretty much everything around, you know, uh, black women raising money. So this came up, and I just didn't see any mainstream media, nothing about it. And I didn't understand why. And so I had been studying it for a few weeks, trying to understand. So that's why I posted the question to ask you guys, like, am I missing a point? Because when I saw what she did, I was like, oh, this is dope. I need to figure out how to do this. Yes, we do. Or teach other, and teach others how to do it. You know, i.e. the the conference that I'm putting on up here. So you know, I don't. You know, I was like, let me ask someone who knows more than me. What's wrong with this picture? You know, um, before I go out and put it out to my networks and say, look, here's an example of a way that you know we don't have to keep knocking down people's doors asking them for a piece of their pie, a piece of their money. You know, we can start doing you know what you're getting into this deep conversation, right? Because <laughs> let, me, yeah, let, me, let, me, let me just say this. When I'm looking across the people that's joining, Tony's a technologist, Charlton's a technologist, you know, Clarence a technologist, mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of mm -hmm. a quasi semi technologist <laughs> and Terry's kind of quasi semi technologist. But when we probably look across our industry, yes, to, mm -hmm. at least from my viewpoint, there is a lack of representation from first African Americans and then or blacks, wh whatever you want to be called, and then the the female African Americans and blacks, and even females in general mm -hmm. in in technology. Um, there was an article that just came out this week about Google, and uh, that employee got fired about what he said about you know diversity. Mm -hmm. but, if we, but if we go a level higher than that, when you look at technology, honestly. Technology is happening a lot, really offshores, and a lot of people are coming to the U.S. with visas, mm -hmm. right? That's that's really taking over the technology industry. You may see someone that may be the the majority, you know, typical, you know, white male, you know, beard and skinny jeans or something, you know, to saying, yeah, I lead this company, but he may not be the person behind doing the work. So, so what happens is, which I'm I'm a part of, um, my company. They've been doing like girls can code. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a big, big organization around, you know, teaching, you know, young, especially African-American women how to code, um, start kids off coding early. Right. So for me, I think it's coming for us. It's just going to take a little while longer. Mm -hmm. But one thing I, I talked to Tony about and, and, and I want to do in this in this page is like the young lady. I think she's here out of Atlanta. I need to figure out how can I reach out to her, right? And say, hey, can you come share your story? This is our organization. So for us, we're just getting started. I mean, we're only a month old. We have almost 200 people in the group, but we need this group to start kind of pushing it out to people, right? And saying, hey, come check this out. And Cause I always believe in six you know, degrees of separation. I'm one person away from meeting that young lady. Right. Right, that started this and just for her to come in and tell us her story that that could be what we talk about in two weeks from now right like let's get her on here let's let's get that technology and see what what type of uh, wisdom that she can she can put on us or, or give us some nuggets right but that's really what the association is about so as we continue and I go out and most of these people are on here because I talk to them on a normal basis dude you got to come check this out 
I don't have all the answers, right? But this is what we all get a chance to to learn. So when you said, what do we do next or what do we do now? I think it's about us having word of mouth, finding articles, finding people of, of color that are out here in this space and trying to invite them in and say, hey, can you just spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes, tell us your story, right? Um, you never know, talking to us, we may go and buy her coin just because we want to support each other. I don't even know the name of her coin, not off the top of my head. So, so those are the types of things that I want to make sure we're able to do in this association. Okay. Yep. And and this is um, Tony, and I wanted to kind of toss something in there too, because I'm not sure if you heard me talking about it a little bit earlier. Like, there's a psychological component to this, as well as the technology part of it. So I did hear you, know, you say that. I did. Like, I can. <laughs> I, I read the white paper, and you know, from a technology perspective. So one of the first questions I asked myself, is this, this something that benefits from the coin technology or is this something that could be done with client server and probably um, also be done? It could be done in both places. Mm -hmm. Then for me, it's like, okay, well, this could have gone either way. The ICO route is a great way to be able to raise money because I, I'm, I'm, I wanted to talk about ICOs just a little bit because I'm not sure what you guys know about that. Um, but ICOs are like, there's hey, a Tony, token standard. Tony, one quick thing. Yep. Do the, do the yep. tone. Just touch on it, but let's talk about that during our next session in, in two weeks, right? We Guys, okay. we kind of want to get on this rhythm, but what we want to know is what you want to talk about. And I know ICOs is a big one, right? Especially with a lot of regulation that's coming up around them. So we want to make sure we have a session just to really talk about that. So we can all, you know, understand that if we have a product, how do we launch it? How do we how do we raise capital, right? But, but Tony, kind of go high level, and then that'll be where we end it for today's discussion and make sure we come back in a few weeks and we talk about you know the ICO. Yeah, that's perfect. So there's a, a token standard called ERC20, and that's maintained by Ethereum. And um, what that means is I can go out there, I can create a coin right now. As long as my coin fits the standards, I can have what's called initial coin offering. And with my initial coin offering, I can say I'm going to sell X number at X at Y price, and I raise all that money. So that's the raising money part of it. I would never want to get in the way of anybody <laughs> raising any money. And as a matter of fact, like because she's one of us, I would never even say anything disparaging about what she's trying to do at all. So, you know, I would love, uh, Anthony, if you could get her to let her have some conversations with people and kind of talk through her idea, because with the ability to raise like $7 million without a whole bunch of support and jumping through hoops and going to dinners and all this other stuff, like this whole game has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Mo most definitely. So, you know, I will, I make sure I, I reach out and I will try to send an email and see if I can find her on LinkedIn or, or how I can do it. You Facebook or something, right? Well, I do, I go do my, my secret, secret spying stuff to see if we can find her here. So, Hey, you know, with the last few moments here, you know, first I want to say everyone, thank you for joining, you know, second, sorry for technical difficulties. We're still trying to work this out. As you know, we're, we're streaming in this session. So this is the Hangout session, but it's also streaming live on YouTube. This will actually be on YouTube so you can share this link. Um, you can put it on your own personal page, talk about it. But I want to go around the horn if there's anybody has any last minute questions. Uh, Clarence, I know you've been kind of quiet. Don't know if you have one here. Just want to make sure when we do these Hangouts, everybody feels like they're contributing and, they're, and everybody's voice is heard right so that's part of what this association is about not just listening to us ramble on but making sure that we listen to you and your voice so clarence you, you got any questions before we end hey can you hear me yep i can hear you clarence yeah man i don't have any um particular questions you know me man i sit at work researching this all day so <laughs> Pretty much all I've been doing is reading articles, uh, Segwit locked in today, and um, I'm just gathering up my funds. So Cool, cool. See, see everybody? I mean, people people are here. We're, we're working in the background, right? We're trying to figure this out. But hey. Uh, I, have, I have just one more just one more question before we go, man. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Charlton. So I just kind of have, not haphazardly jumped in, but, you know, I've been kind of eager and uh, you know, based off the background, I'm trying to get more information. But so, so this past weekend, I jumped in and threw a couple bucks on Ethereum and on Bitcoin, and I saw the other post about the Jacks. But you know, uh, I was I, 
just just traditionally trying to like just uh, remember how well learn how the the whole Jax being a wallet and Coinbase being like the payment gateway to buy the actual coin. I was trying to transfer it over, but I was kind of hesitant just reading out some of the other articles about, you know, um, once it's gone, it's gone, it's lost, it's lost. So I mean, if you can briefly explain, um, you know, what JAX is, how can we transfer it over there and the use of like uh, Coinbase? Because more yeah. specifically, that's what I've, been, I've used to kind of kind of jump in there kind of early. Okay, I'll give you the simplified version because I know Tony, Tony will go deep, right? Yeah. Jax, Jax, <laughs> Jax is, a, is just a, a wallet. So think about like the wallet in your pocket, right? That's the easiest way that I'll say. And take, you know, um, Coinbase as an exchange, just like if you bought, let's just say stock, it's, it's an exchange. So once you buy it in Coinbase, which I have a Coinbase account, and I, and I know a lot of people here do, right? Then when you're ready to move it out of Coinbase, you have to say, why do I want to move it, right? I move mine to a wallet because my Jax wallet for me is a little bit more secure than an exchange. And a lot of people do that is because historically, you know, there has been some hacks on exchanges and people have lost their Bitcoins. Okay, there was a big takedown of another exchange by, um, by the federal, I think the FBI, you know, a week ago, right? Because this guy actually stole Bitcoins and they trade, they finally traced it back to him. Um, but once you take it off of that, you have to think it's not like physical money in your wallet. Jack's just just kind of maps to where in the bit in the in the blockchain your private key and how much you owe, how much you own. Right. So it just looks at the blockchain and says, Charlton owns this this much. And it's just like if you buy in stock, you know, it's all ones and zeros. Right. No one sends you a piece of paper saying you own this much in your 401k share. Right. Here's your actual share of a GE stock or, you know, IBM stock, etc. So when you think about that, if you wanted to, to actually move it, you go on to Coinbase and you can go to send. And if you want to send money, then what you would do is you're going to want to send it to your public uh, address or your public key that's in your Jax wallet, right? So if you go over to your Jax wallet, you look around the top middle, you'll see this little, you know, long key. I mean, you know, tons of characters, 18, 20 characters. You copy that, you go back into Coinbase and paste it. And the only thing that you're doing is sending money right to your Jax wallet. When that happens, that that money will actually leave out of the exchange and go into your Jax wallet and you can just hold it there right and then the good thing about Jax is you can do use what we call shapeshift if you want to buy if you want to take the bitcoin and transfer it into ethereum you can do it right on your Jax wallet um and they have different currencies so if you actually i know it's, you know two weeks ago we posted on that if you go back two weeks you know tony's doing screenshots of of all of that and what we were and what we were showing um, from that aspect, right? So, but really, um, hopefully that answered it, Charlton. Um, which, which what what your question was? I per we personally feel most of us all have Jack's wallets is safer um, than than the exchange, and I just utilize exchange either buy or or sell. You know my uh, my Bitcoin. I got you. Okay, thanks. So I have a I, I have a question. <laughs> Because uh, I feel like we're the only ones that are really posting articles in the uh, group. Is there anything that we can do to kind of encourage more participation from other people? Like one of the things that I was thinking about, maybe having some type of, uh, you know, some type of contest with uh, a portfolio of altcoins and the winner gets some type of a uh, Bitcoin prize or something like that. So anything that you guys can think of to kind of encourage more participation, because I don't want to feel like I'm the only person that's putting stuff in there. I feel like I'm dominating the, the group. <laughs> yeah, man, like quick question, because I, I mean, I post stuff here and there and this is Clarence. I mean, I'm sitting there reading all kind of articles most of the day, but I don't want to just spam pretty much everybody with the articles that I'm reading just because they're accessible from other sites. You, you, so. you, have, you have to think about it. The, the group that we have, right. And I go back to how this kind of started was Tony was posting some cool articles on his personal page. I'm like, man, where is he going to get that? Right. And what I figured out was, man, if I look at where he went, I can't remember all the sites that he goes to. 
right? So I look yeah. at our page almost like, and I hate to use other technology, Flipbook, right? It compiles all these different locations. So for me, I encourage people, if you, if you find an article you think this cool, put it on the page. It's because, you know, it gives us one place to go to or gives at least some of our our, uh, our members, group members, one place to go to, to 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 find it. They don't have to go out and look at all these other different, um, you know, type of places. Yeah. Even if I take it from another page, right, which I've done that before, another digital currency page. But don't forget, this page is for us. We can, hey, we can spin it to, to how we see it, right? Or to me, if it's something that I don't necessarily like or believe in, I'm going to say, man, I really don't trust this article, and I might put that in the writing, or I'm not going to post it. That's just my my own personal preference. Right. Right? Because you, cause you're reading some stuff, and you're like, eh. And I mean, there's so much conspiracy theory stuff. It's people trying to trying to sell you on hopes and dreams, you know, in their articles. So to me, post it if, if you find something, especially you, Clarence, because I'm going to read it, right? You put me on block folio. I didn't know about that till you posted it. Gotcha. And this is and this is definitely not a place where and I know in a lot of the other places where I get information because I probably go to roughly fifty or so sources a day. Like there's there's a culture of if you ask a question or if you say something that's incorrect, then people descend on you like the beehive. Trying to have that type of culture here because we have varying levels of expertise or interest or passion about this. Um, in general. So there's no question, bad questions except the ones that people don't ask. There's no bad articles except the ones that people don't post. And everybody's not going to see every article that's posted anyway. So it's just a repository for information for all of us. And one and one other thing you can do to sift through that repository is if you go up to the top, you can actually type in like the word wallet for, for Talton. And you're going to see every article we have that people have posted that has the word like wallet, you know, in there, right? So you'll be able to quickly, you know, sift through all of that. And as Tony said, we don't want to inundate or, or seem like we're putting too much, but we, we're trying to hit it from high level technology, you know, low understanding. We want to cater to everybody from an education standpoint. And that's why these hangout sessions are actually the most important people to me that you can have because we get to come on here and ask any question. And, and to me, there's not a stupid question, as Tony said. Like, I don't care if we feel like we're starting our way back on ground zero. If you're on here and you're supporting it, we're going to address it, right? Because we all want to learn together, right? And uh, iron sharpens iron, as I, as, I, as I said before. And each one teach one. So this is, this is our place for us. So that's why we created this association. And there's a lot of money to be made. And by the time they educate us about that money, it will be gone. Yes. So... <laughs> we gotta get in there as quickly as possible. Exactly <laughs> right. So that's the key, right there. That's the key. That's the key, man. You gotta get in early. I mean, you gotta take a risk to, uh, you know, you gotta take a risk sometime. And, and here's here's the last part. There are some people trying to promote stuff on the site. Some of these articles and posts we're starting to to delete because we want to make sure, like, you're representing it right. But let's just take and, and is it is it Tanya? Um, if you say, hey, man, I got a movie coming out. It's about this. It's about that. I'm going to post that on the site because you're a member. You've contributed. And it might not even deal with digital currency, but you might talk about it a little bit, right? I, I don't know, but I want to make sure from an entrepreneur standpoint, on this line, I know four of y'all are entrepreneurs, five of us are entrepreneurs. If we have something, I want to make sure this is another site, but it's clean. We're not really trying to sell them anything. We're just saying, hey, this is what exists. This is what we have going on. If you ever want want to join, if you just keep posting every week, you know we're gonna block your posts, right? But we just want to make sure you get a chance to actually use this as a platform, um, um, because we have great people and we have, you know, maybe the next millionaire sitting on this line right now with this technology, you know. So that's how I feel. We all want to invest in each other. So. So hey, I know we're a little bit over time. You know, number one, thank y'all for coming out. You didn't have to spend this this evening with us. Number two, as Tony said, we really want you to tell us what you want to talk about. If you want to talk about initial coin offers, offerings, if you want to go deep on a particular coin like Ether, um, and smart contracts, IOTA, that gives us a chance over the next two weeks to go and do our research, kind of bring it all together and make sure that, you know, we can bring some, some good information here. 
please, please, please post. Let us know what you want to talk about. Um, you know, share the page with people. Go to YouTube, like us, subscribe, share this video. You know, this is this is how we're gonna grow, and I believe it's, it's millions of us in the in the United States and around you know and around the world. But we only have two hundred people so far, and this is the only one that's dedicated for us. So let's try to you know do our best to get some of the smartest and the brightest people that we can that understands this technology and uh, and it has future aspirations of growing in this space. You know, so we can all you know learn. So that's that's my only ask that I always ask every time. But outside of that, you know, thank you all for, for joining this evening. Like I said, you can find this actual video, this session that we had on YouTube, on our YouTube page under, you know, Digital Currency um, Association for Minorities. We have a page there. Last week's video, two weeks ago video is there. And then Tony and I will come back in about two weeks. So let us know your topic and look forward to talking to y'all then. Oh, one, one last thing. If anybody's in New York City, um, there's a tech and inclusion conference that's happening uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Tomorrow I'll be doing uh, career readiness and guidance for uh, resume people who are doing the career fair. And then Thursday, it's just a good place to come out there and connect with people who are really trying to do a lot in the diversity and inclusion space. Yes. Um, in general. So. I'm not in New York, but I, one day, Tony, I do plan on coming up to visit you so we can sit down. So you gotta do it, man. I know, you know, I'm, tra I'm traveling so much, man. <laughs> I, I'm gone for the next few months, but uh, but yeah, hey, everybody, thank you all. Have a great evening. Look forward to talking to you in two weeks.